My uh, two older children, Andrew and Georgiana, are getting to the age now where they're starting to play with other kids with greater independence. Um, and I'm finding that my greatest hope, now particularly when they visit friends, is not that they will have fun and not even primarily that they will be safe. But my hope is that they will be nice and behave themselves well. Now, I could, I could try and say that I have this hope because I know that when they are nice and behave themselves, then they are more likely to be safe and get along and have a better time. Uh, but in reality, I am motivated by a more sinful desire. Pride. Uh, you know, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and my fear is that if they are rude or unkind, then it will reflect badly on me. You know, when they were smaller, uh, we would sit with them and help them play with blocks with other toddlers, and when they stole from the babies or threw stuff at them, uh, we would, you know, say, no, don't do that. And we'd apologise to the parents of the grieved baby and everyone would kind of shrug and say something about, you know, toddlers, you know, what can you do? No big deal. Uh, but now that they are older, the expectation is that they should know better. I find my motivation for disciplining my children is hard to get right. I frequently have to fight the desire to create these shiny little trophy children to show everyone uh, just how clever and good I am. You know, apparently when Queen Elizabeth and her sister were children, when they were princesses, their mother would sit them down before they had social visits and um, tell them that no matter what the behaviour of the other children was like, they, Elizabeth and Margaret, uh, were to behave differently. They were royal children, and royal children must have royal behaviour. Well, we have been working steadily through the book of Titus so far, and one thing that has struck me is just how much Paul is concerned with the behaviour of Christians. Uh, there have been instructions for church leaders for older men, older women, younger women and younger men. You'll hopefully have noticed that it isn't a complete list of behaviours or attributes that should mark someone as a believer. However, it is a list that includes everyone who calls himself a believer, everyone who trusts in Jesus. Old, young, woman or man, uh, we are all instructed to follow sound doctrine and are given examples of godly behaviour in Titus chapter 2. However, as with any list of good works that we read in the Bible, there is a big danger for us to be wary of. Just as I get it wrong when I make my children's behaviour all about me, so too I get it wrong when I make my behaviour, the way I act as a Christian, all about me as well. Ever since the fall, since Adam and Eve disobeyed God and were sent away from him and Eve and Eden, his paradise, people have had an all about me and what I do attitude in their efforts to restoring their relationship with God. All of the major world religions, excluding Christianity, are based on works, are all about what you have to do. Now, I'm sure that if we were to take a poll down the main street of Narrabri and ask people why they should be allowed to go to heaven, that many would respond with something along the lines of, well, I've tried to live a good life and be a decent sort of person. You know, that's, that's why I should be allowed in. Now, don't get me wrong. It is right and good to want to try and live a good life. 
The problem is that history, both in a global um, and personal sense, shows that we just aren't that good at being good. But if that is true and if Christianity is meant to be different from the other religions, why have we had all this stuff about doing good works over the last few weeks? You know, even today's passage starts with a list of good works for slaves to do. What's with that? And what about passages like Ephesians 2, chapter 10, which says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Well, as with all passages of Scripture, context is key. And in both the Ephesians 2 and Titus 2 passages, we can see that, yes, we are called to do good works, but it is the how and the why of the works that makes the difference, that sets us apart. As we look at all the different behaviours, works or attributes of the different groups within the church, we see that one attribute, one behaviour, um, one particularly keeps recurring and it's the idea of being self-controlled. You know, when we were discussing this in Bible study the other week, uh, we all had a bit of a chuckle at our lack of self-control when it comes to certain foods. Uh, for me, I struggle with most foods that start with a ch sound. There's chocolate, chips, cheese, cherries, chicken, particularly KFC, uh, <laughs> chorizo, you know, all these foods that I find hard not to pig out on whenever they are put in front of me. I really struggle with self-control there. And we, we all really struggle with self-control in one form or another, I think, which is probably why Paul is so keen to emphasise it. Now... If I think that my behaviour and works are all about me, then I'm starting to get really down about now. I'm getting burdened, discouraged. See, if God wants me to be self-controlled, well, clearly I'm not. I guess that's it then. I'm a terrible Christian. God will never let me in. Well, that's how we think sometimes, isn't it? Um, and it is, I've got to say, wrong thinking. But it is thinking that can infect our minds when we succumb to sin. But what does the Bible say? Well, we've been working to memorise verses 11 to 14 of chapter 2 and we are going to have a closer look at them now. So how does it start? No words this time. Well, no words up there. We're going to say them. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Stop. Don't get carried away. When I worked at the town school, we used to do this great little uh, comprehension activity to help kids understand and make meaning of what they read. Uh, if I was going to use the, that first verse with the kids, I might ask them... A question like this. I might say, uh, well, what has appeared? And they would answer me, uh, the grace of God, sir. Oh, great answer. That's correct. The grace of God or the free gift or undeserved gift from God has appeared. And then I might ask, and what does this free gift from God do? And they would say to me, uh, it brings salvation, sir. Oh, well done, top of the class. That's right. The free gift of God brings salvation. It saves. It is a saving grace. Now, we all like presents. Uh, so the final question is a great one with a great answer. Uh, to whom has the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to? And they would respond with, to all men, sir. 
Uh, but that doesn't just mean the bloke, sir, does it? It's more the idea of all people from all different races, both men, women and children, slave and free, because Paul included all of those categories in his previous list, didn't he, sir? And he wouldn't have meant men, you know, if it were just the men. No, that's right. Well done, genius child. Gold star for you. And in that wonderful verse, we see that God offers salvation to all people and that it is a free gift to all people and not, I repeat, not dependent on any good thing that we do. You know, this idea is repeated in Ephesians chapter 2 that Warwick cut up earlier, where we see that in verse 1, if you wish to follow along, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, it's kind of hard to do good works when you're dead. Verses 4 and 5, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Verses 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Godly living and good works have no value to save your life to earn your way to God and heaven. But if this is the case, then why exactly does Paul go on about it? There are, I think, two reasons given in Titus chapter 2. The first reason is so that we become living examples of the joy and the good that comes from living under God's rule. Jesus says that we are to be salt and light in the world, distinct and different, always pointing others to the glory of God, always showing others the way to God. Now, we might have missed it over the last few weeks, the way we've broken up the passages, but um, Paul says the words, so that, three times after giving instructions on how God's people are to live in chapter 2. The first one is in verse 5. He says, So that no one will malign, uh, that is, speak spitefully or critically about the word of God. Verse 8. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. And today in verse 10. So that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. And then he ends chapter 2, summing up, saying, These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. God wants us to live his way, to do good works, to live differently to the lazy, evil, brutish Cretans who we once were and still live amongst, so that others may see that the grace of God that brings salvation has indeed appeared, that it is there for them too, and that it is a desirable gift. Again, if we were to survey people in Narrabri and ask them uh, what it is that puts them off about church, I bet that many of them would say that it is the Christians hypocritical Christians. Now, if we are trying to do good works to show others how good we are, if it's all about us, then we are completely open to that charge of being hypocritical. But if we freely acknowledge that we are sinners, saved only by the grace of God, then our good works and godly behaviour will do good work in people as they look to Jesus too. The second reason that we are given to live a godly life is because of what we have been saved from and what it cost to save us. The Bible describes us 
prior to receiving the gift of saving grace, not only being dead, but also of being slaves to sin. You know, it's like we had drowned in the ocean. We were going down in shark-infested water when God plucked us from the ocean and put us on his life raft and breathed life into us. He did that because he loves us and wants us to be his people. And the cost of that great love for us was the life of his son. Have a look at verses 13 and 14. We'll start towards the end of 13. Our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You know, I like that raft analogy. Uh, It's not mine, by the way. Completely flogged it from someone else. Um, I may have added the shark a bit, though. Um, It's a good analogy. We have been saved from the water, from the ocean, from the sharks and sin, and put on the boat, but we're still surrounded by the sea of sin until Jesus returns and we reach the shores of heaven. In chapter 2, Paul is urging us to stop jumping back in the water. Jesus died to save us from it. So stop swimming in it. Also, there are other people out there who need rescuing. If they see you splashing around in the sin ocean, having a grand old time, well, they might think that their need of rescue isn't so great. By living God's way, we stay on the boat and call out to others that help us come. It is real. God loves them, has saved them already, if only they too will accept the gift. But this brings us back to the self-control thing, doesn't it? And the fact that it is so, so hard sometimes to live God's way on that boat. Well, there is more good news and more grace for us here in Titus chapter 2. John says in his gospel, chapter 1, that we have received grace upon grace. And we see that here. You know, if we keep trying to do good works in our own strength, we will fail. But the grace of God doesn't save us from sin, doesn't just save us from sin, sorry, It also teaches us how to live God's way as we wait for Jesus' return and enables us to live God's way. We are all royal children. We are children of the King. And God, our King and Father, wants us to have royal behaviour. His grace enables and teaches us to live as royal children. Well, how can we live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age? We remember who we are, who we were and how we changed. We are now children of the King. We were slaves to sin. It cost the blood of Jesus to take us from the one to the other. Remembering who we are and who we were will help us want to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. When we fail, we remember that we aren't purifying ourselves by our works. Jesus is purifying us. You know, that is an ongoing process and it is hard. So we repent. And we talk to God our Father about it and seek his help through his Spirit to live his way. Brothers and sisters, I have to confess that I don't always think this way. Sometimes I want to jump back in the ocean and have a swim, forgetting what it costs to get me out. 
Sometimes I um, want to hold on to the back and be like, uh, kick the legs, be a little propeller, um, kick like Billy O, attempting to help get that boat to shore quicker. I want to do my bit, forgetting that I am completely powerless to earn salvation or favour, forgetting that I am already saved and that I cannot be loved more than I already am because I am completely always loved by the Lord. So let us remember that it is God's grace alone that enables us to live his way and show the beauty of the gospel to those who are lost so that his kingdom will grow. Let us remember that we are children of the King. Let us remember the cross of Christ that opens the way to glory. Let us live like children of the King out of thankfulness thankfulness and in the strength of Christ. Let us point to our risen Saviour and the grace that has appeared with our actions, with our deeds and also with our words.